All right, welcome to Third Sunday Forum, everyone. My name is Terry Osby. Welcome to you in person. Welcome to people joining us at home and people who may be watching this recording later online. Um, I approve that you use the same recorder. Um, thank you for joining us today. Um, I am so pleased to welcome Chris Shane here. Exactly. Christine here to um, Third Sunday Forums to join us to talk about Braver Angels and post election engagement the Braver Angels way. I learned about Braver Angels through Minnesota Public Radio's Talking Sense series. If you um, would like to listen on the radio or check out more, we have um, quite a few stories up that they've done over the past year about um, having hard conversations and um, Again, like I said, this is a very timely presentation, and I will make sure we have lots of time to talk and turn it right over to Chris. Thank you. Thanks, Gary. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, as I mentioned, for some of the people that came in, uh, I go to John the Evangelist just down the street here a little bit, and I can tell I'm in a Methodist church, not a Catholic one, because more of you are sitting towards the front. <laughs> You know, it's the front row. Yeah, yeah, that one's still empty. Huh? Uh, but thank you for coming. Uh, this is a this is an interesting time in politics for all of us. Um, it's not the first, and it won't be the last that we've seen in this country. And I think for those who are either you know feeling really good or feeling really bad, um, I always remind people that we go through cycles, and uh, and and we persevere regardless. It's we the people that ultimately decide how our country is going to go. So uh, let's just jump right into it. Election was a couple of weeks ago, but the emotions are still really raw about it. Um, there are about 800 or so moderators for Great Angels. That's what I do. Uh, we lead the workshops across the United States. And we usually get together on a Zoom call once, once every month. Typically, we do a little training or something like that. This time, it was just a discussion of, uh, of how are people feeling. And it was interesting for some of the folks. And the vernacular within Brave Angels, we'll use blue and red. Blue is more you know, liberal or progressive. Red being more conservative or be more toward, toward perhaps libertarian. Uh, but those folks that lean more to the, the blue um, said, you know, I'm having trouble with this. I, and I know we're all about depolarizing, but right now I don't know if I feel like being depolarized. Um, so you're not alone in that. It's uh, for, you know, for a number of folks, if this is something that they're really struggling with. Um, and, you know, for better or for worse, uh, whether you, your candidates won or lost, you know the opposite feeling from four years ago. So each side has experienced some of this. We got to be aware of that. And it's I, as I mentioned here, you know, if your candidate won, be humble about it. If your candidate lost, be respectful of the other side. Um, hard though that might it, it be at times. And think about how you want to be treated. If again, we're looking at the opposite results to what we had. Um, there are some folks that just want to shut down all the other one. Um, kind of understandable too. But what we hope to do in Brave Angels, and this is going to be a very short version of that, is to give you some tools to have conversations about that and some things to think about and, and conversations to have with people. Our, we have been successful as a country, as successful as we have, because people have been able to talk across their differences. Uh, nobody has all the best ideas. So over time, and it gets messy and it gets ugly um, and it gets like sausage making, but we come together and develop the best ways to move forward. And that's why we have the country that we have today. So when we look at Braver Angels, this is what we call the Braver Angels way. Um, when we talk about depolarization, which is what um, Braver Angels is really uh, founded to do, it's not about uh, not having any disagreements. It's about having disagreements in a civil way. So as we look at it, we state our views freely and uh, fully without fear. We treat people who disagree with us with honesty, dignity, and respect. We welcome opportunities to engage with those with whom we do disagree. We all believe we have blind spots and that all of us are worth talking to. We seek to disagree accurately, avoiding exaggeration and stereotypes. We look for common ground where it exists and if possible, find ways to work together. We believe that in disagreements, both sides share and learn. 
and braver angels, neither side is teaching each other. Or, or the other are giving feedback on how they ought to think or say things differently. So we respect that we're all individuals. We all have different views. Our goal is to be uh, have those conversations across the political divide and without demonizing the other side. We're all you know, we're all human beings here. I did a um, uh, one a workshop, a longer workshop yesterday in Owatonna at one of the Lutheran churches, and um, it was interesting. We had folks that uh, I think somebody that was in their early twenties and somebody that was probably near eighty. So it's uh, and for the whole range of different political views. Um, part of the thing that, uh, that I love working with Brave Angels, people that are you know, looking to find ways to, to bridge that divide. Um, to a certain extent, though, I know I'm preaching to the choir. Because all, you know, all of you in your mind can think of somebody that you know they ought to be here today and they aren't. Okay, well then, in the same way as we, we're, we need to be evangelists of, of our faith, we need to be evangelists on how to how to have conversations across the middle political divide. Now we talk about polarization. What does it really come down to? And these are the four what we call the four horsemen of polarization. It's uh, and and this is not so much. Again, we're not looking at the ideas. People can have other ideas. It's when we start to look at the other side as being the enemy or or, or evil. So stereotyping is throwing everybody into the same pot that all of those Republicans, all of those Democrats. Well, in your own life, you probably know people both in the party that you, you do hold with or independent um, who are all over the range on that. And that's true of the other side as well. People who may think differently, they may feel very strong about some issues, not so much the other. Yes, you need to keep your mic up because it's dropping. Oh, I'm sorry. Gary told me that. Said, Get them over mic as well. <laughs> yeah, we'll be good friends. Um, yeah, that doesn't uh, transmit better. So keep that uh, keep that in mind that there is differences among people that are within individual groups. We all know that instinctively, but it's true from a political spectrum. Or we just dismiss them. Oh, they're just a bunch of small things. Oh, they're a bunch of whatever you know, pejorative term you want to use. Uh, no, there are people that are worth hearing, the people that uh, are, are worth listening to. Uh, ridiculing, just making fun of them. And then just holding them in contempt. You know, they are the enemy. They're trying to wreck our country. Yeah, I don't know anybody that I've come across since, yes, I'm intent on wrecking the country. Probably not. So think about that and and, and how we we try to avoid getting around these particular or, uh, polarizing against them with these four different areas. So one of the things we want to talk about is um, we got Thanksgiving giving dinner coming up. Uh, and what's the question that everybody fears the most? So what do you think about the election? As Carrie and I were talking, there's a reason there's three football games. <laughs> Uh, but inevitably, maybe that question may come up, and um, and you ought to prepare for it, uh, in, in particularly in family settings, because the, the dynamics of that are interesting regardless. Uh, but you know, prepare yourself and stay calm. It's uh, don't allow somebody to push your buttons. Um, you know how Uncle George approaches these things. You know what he's going to say. So, you know, just practice you know, a deep breath and then, you know, come on, pass the tables or something like that. Um, but you also have to decide, you know, maybe you do want to engage. Uh, are you in the mood for the conversation? Okay. Is the other person in the mood for the conversation? I see you shaking your head. I think everybody's kind of feeling that way right now. <laughs> um, but one of the things that, that, that I found most rewarding about Braver Angels, and we'll talk about this in the skills, is uh, to be able to ask questions. Of people who see things differently than we do. And even with our family, there's things we don't know about them. They've had experiences that we're not aware of. I have an identical twin brother. So you know, we kind of knew each other before we even got here. Um, but and we in some ways live some similar lives, but we also live very different lives, have very different occupations. And I learn different things in talking to him all the time. And it's true of your, your family members too. And sometimes it's hard if you have grown kids. Well, you know, I raised, of course, 
No, they left the cool and they had different experiences that you might not be aware of. So what can you learn about them? In one of the workshops that I was at, there was a, you know, somebody from the, the red side and somebody from the blue side and talking about the size and scope of government. And one of the gentlemen said, well, you know, let me tell you my story. I said, you know, I grew up in a, in a poor household and um, I wanted to go to college. There wasn't any money for me to go to college. So looked around and by gosh, there was a state program that I did some work in the summer to pay for my tuition books and, and, uh, and room and board. He says, you know what? I got my degree. I wanted to go to law school. No money for that either. But I found a federal program that allowed me to be able to go to law school. And I did. And the type. Um, and I did. He says, you know what? I've been an incredibly successful lawyer. I need a ton of money. Boy, I paid a lot of taxes. He says, but I do that knowing that my taxes are going to programs that could help somebody like me. Well, okay, you may be for bigger government, you may not, but living that experience from that gentleman's perspective, you can see how he feels us like he does. And everybody, everybody has a story. We don't uh, believe or support policies usually just randomly. There's reasons, there's something in our life experience, something that we've seen within our family that drives us to feel the way that we do. So we wanna be we want to be aware of that. And, and again, it can be a fascinating journey learning more and more about the, the people that are in your family. So we walked through the whole prayer. I know you've already had a prayer service here today, but the one thing I wanna uh, point out here is that, that I, uh, grant that I might not so much seek to be understood as to as to understand, and so sometimes that that's difficult. But with the braver angels approach, we're looking to learn about the other person, and that means taking a step back and not necessarily giving our opinions up front, listening to them first, hoping to understand where they come from, and then use that information to try to build bridges and ultimately be able to express your opinions in a way that will actually be heard. We can all talk at, talk at each other. He is to be able to talk with each other. There's a, um, a preacher named Andy Stanley. Anybody aware of him? Okay, you've heard him before too. His dad was a, uh, he was a televangelist or, or uh, Baptist, I think. Uh, but anyway, Andy Stanley's more of an Oshucks kind of guy. And he did a, um, after the 2016 election, uh, had kind of looked across the um, church world, as he calls it, and said, you know, in a lot of ways, it's been kind of embarrassing how we as church world, both those of us that are, are members of the congregation and those who lead the congregation, have treated each other from a political perspective. If Jesus was watching us, and he is, would you be proud of our behavior or not? So he wrote a book called Not, Win, Not In It to Win It, but he did a show a couple of years ago, right before Thanksgiving, and, um, and said there's a couple of questions you can ask to engage over Thanksgiving to actually learn something about the people that you uh, that are part of your family. So one of the questions he said, ask somebody, how do you come to feel as you do about this issue or person? Um, that's non-judgmental. Now, right today, I think it's kind of difficult for uh, for many of us in in looking at the election's result to do that. I know a lot of my uh, blue friends have, have said to me, you know, hey, I just don't understand. It seems like morals and values don't matter anymore. And then I talked to some of my red friends. And they said, you know, I've heard that. And what I hear is judgment that you're immoral and have zero values. And that's coming from somebody who knows nothing about them. So asking it this, how we ask the question is, uh, makes a big difference. Uh, if we ask him, how could you vote for that idiot? Okay, you're not asking the question, you made a statement. Um, and the response you're gonna get is in kind. Where if you phrase it this way, and maybe at this time, to get it with somebody from the, the, uh, as opposite you politically in your family, when you uh, phrase this, hey, you know, I know that you and I see things differently politically, and I'm not looking to pick a fight here, but I want to understand 
Can you tell me, you know, how did you come to feel this way? What was your, your decision-making process? And you'll learn something. You may not agree with it at all, but you'll learn something about that from them, about what their thought process was. Second one, have you always felt that way? I can get into those are you know pivot points within your life that caused you to look at this differently. And then lastly, if, it, if you haven't always felt this way, what was the thing that changed your mind? And in doing this, you'll learn things. But you're also showing that other person that you're interested in them. And despite the fact that we might be you know at political odds right now, I'm still interested in you. So you learn people's story. There's a reason they feel the way they do. So this is the, uh, in, in most of our brain range of things, this is uh, some, some basic communication stuff, which we probably all you already know, but we use that in, in kind of how we develop our approach to talking to people who are from the other side. And we use our, the acronym of LAP. It's listen, acknowledge, pivot, and perspective. We'll talk about each one of those individually. But um, it's also easier for, easier for us to remember because it's the laugh is the last name of one of the founders of Brave Rangers, a guy called David Laugh. So um, he can't completely claim uh, ownership of that. The skills themselves are developed by um, by another fellow who is a professor at the University of Minnesota. Um, Bill Dorn is his name, and his background is marriage counseling. So, in some respects, communication across difficult issues, you know, that doesn't happen in anybody's marriage. Uh, and we all know that you, you, if you explain your spouse, well, here's how, here's how I see it, they're going to go, for, oh, if only I thought about that. <laughs> well, that doesn't happen in your house. Doesn't happen. So, anyway, the first part of it is listen, and particularly around the political issues, and particularly now. It's so difficult for us to be really active listeners. Somebody starts talking and we're starting to develop our response. What am I gonna say? Why is that a stupid thing? And you've lost track of whatever it is that you're talking about. So what we're looking to do here is to turn that inner debate off on who we listen. Because what's coming up next is that we're gonna to look to find something perhaps we agree with or be able to reiterate to somebody what you heard them say and ask for clarification. And that's kind of like the test at school, that, okay, I never studied for it, and I do so well for it. So you're gonna have to listen and be able to respond back to folks about what is it that, uh, that they said. So get ready to summarize and focus on their viewpoints and look for areas of agreement. Uh, we find that a lot when you talk, um, we, we get pretty heated about discussions. Um, let's take something like hunger. You know, people will have different approaches towards it and be very passionate about that. But at its core, I don't know anybody that says, yeah, I think poor people ought to starve. I don't find many people like that, if any. And so it's a matter of how we get about addressing that issue, not so matter that, uh, that we don't agree that that is an issue. So second for folks that a little bit to share on their experience, what has made it difficult for you, particularly over the last couple of weeks, to listen from people who, who differ from you politically? Yeah. When I comment about something and I'm attacked, then it immediately makes me angry. And instead of following Pastor Jenny's message, <laughs> I, I want to hit back. And it, because it hurts, because it, it was not attacking what I said, it was attacking my belief. There you go. Uh, just, I'm going to summarize that because I didn't get the microphone to you time. But uh, it's a feeling of, of being attacked. And then that's an attack on me personally, not an attack on, on my particular view. Do I have that about right? Thank you for sharing. Others? Anybody else? Well, when someone might say something, uh, that you disagree with, it's so easy, like you said, if that inner debater is not turned off, to be like, oh, that's not true, or yeah, but what about this, or whatever other response that you might have kind of preloaded, if you're not willing to kind of cut that off at the gate, then it just turns into to more of an argument instead of hearing and validating what they're saying. Thank you. Anybody else? 
See if I can get over there. I have found that if you don't concentrate on the candidates and try to defend or talk about your opinions about the candidates and stay over the issues and ask questions around those, you get to a better place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Terry Mullich. Uh, 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 oh, Terry, sorry. Oh, okay. Not like I'm no. <laughs> and somebody's asking me to use technology, and I'm going to pass it. Well, I, see. <laughs> I think if you have a prior history with that person, sometimes it's hard to start out with a clean slate for the conversation. It's very difficult when people make statements that you believe to be totally untrue. Mm -hmm. Just a lot of discourse now is a soundbite from usually from the media that's sort of amplifying a fringe or something that's not all that relevant to having a more productive conversation. George said, how many Democrats are here? And I put my hand up. But when Dick put his hand up, biology teacher and track coach changed the whole world. <laughs> In Andy Stanley's uh, discussion about how to have, handle Thanksgiving, he had two other questions that I didn't put up there. Um, one of them was when you're having those conversations, uh, to ask somebody, to get their time about a political uh, Official, do you know this person? And in reality, many of us really do. We know a little piece of it. That one I thought some of little bit snarky, so I don't have to use that. Um, but the last one, the fourth one's kind of interesting. It said, "Well, where do you get your information?" You know, and it's different now. I mean, my hair's gray enough that I remember when it was the three networks that you got your information from. It's different now. But if you really think about it, and you made the point really well that we get a snippet. A headline, and um, and if I'm really honest about it, it might be there's a three minute news clip that I have not paid attention to for about thirty seconds, and I, I, I think that's true of most of us. Uh, once upon a time, I, I worked in the utility business um, in my professional career and was spokesperson for a long time, and we were coming out with this huge rate increase, and it was all the newspaper all over the. The television, I felt like my face was plastered everywhere. Um, so I go to the dentist, and uh, a woman who I know for a long time comes to the receptionist there and um, says, Oh, yeah, I saw you. I saw you on the news the other night. Oh, do you remember what it was about? You like work for the phone company or something, don't you? <laughs> so, you know, she even knew me that wasn't paying that much attention. So I think for all of us, sometimes it's just a snippet of information. Um, and, and so you know, taking just a little bit of a headline, and that's yeah. true, that can be true of all of us. Well, thank you all for sharing. I appreciate that. The second one is the acknowledged part of it. Uh, when somebody has said something, sometimes it's particularly now, it's pretty difficult. You, you try to find something you agree with. They've gone on for a bit, they've finished, say, well, if I'm hearing you right, I think your concern is about the issue of crime. Or my concern, your concern is about the issue of, um, of a social safety net or something like that. Yeah. Or I can tell, I can hear from you that this issue is really important to you. So you really haven't said anything about your own opinion. You're trying to reflect back that you've listened actively to what they had to say. Um, and so now that you've had the opportunity, and you know, if you find something you can agree with, please do so. Um, and pause and ask for clarification, because sometimes, you know, in the heat of the moment, what we think we heard wasn't what they said, or they said that, but it's not the way they meant it. So give them the opportunity to do that. And again, it's a really hard to charge issue, kind of tough to keep the temperature down. Um, but you're in this, you're kind of in this conversation for the long run. 
The third one is a little different that we don't typically do, um, I think, in our society. Is this is a pivot. Somebody's gone and you've asked their opinion, you've asked them about something, they've shared their opinion, you've acknowledged it, and you may go back and forth on that a couple of times, but you want to, you're looking to get to the point where you can share your perspective as well. And so you stop for a second and say, um, you know, this is all really interesting. Can I share with you a story about my life that's kind of influenced the way I think about this? Or, um, you know, I've come to look at this thing differently after whatever the life experience was. Uh, or simply, would you mind me sharing with you how I feel about that and what shaped my opinions? Uh, now, some people are going to start talking about what they think. Yeah. And, and you know who they are. <laughs> and sometimes you're looking in the mirror at them. Um, but, um, and that's okay. You can go through that, and you might have to acknowledge again and try again. If after one or two tries, it's not going anywhere, and you don't beat a dead horse, let it go. Let's go watch the game, do something, exit the conversation gracefully. Um, but most people will give you a head nod or a, oh, okay, go ahead. And now you've got the opportunity to share your side of, of, of the issue, how you feel about it, to pro provide your perspective. Uh, important to use I statements on this. This is how I feel, not this is the way it is. Um, so, you know, that's sharing from your from deep inside your heart. Name the source of your views if you have them, or how you came to feel about the way you share a story again, like the gentleman did about his his uh, college and um, and law school experience. And again, you find places where you can agree. Uh, one more story from my past, and I'll, I promise I'll stop. Well, there'll be one more after that. But anyway, uh, I in the electric utility business, uh, we made we made a business of uh, fighting the environment. Did it for a long time. We all got really good at it too. Um, but I was involved in starting a, a new program out that I thought the environmentalists would like, and they didn't. So hmm, I went up to what was called the Midwest Energy, the Midwest Renewable Energy Fair, kind of a mix of Woodstock and uh, and a trade fair, and that's where all the uh, and I got a tie dye shirt with some samples, um, like early 80s. So um, anyway, the, I went up there and I got to talk to some of the leaders of the environmental community. And I said, you know, put this program together and I thought you'd like it. And as we sat down there and we were talking around it, I don't think it was a campfire, but it felt like it. Um, I said, well, you, did you ever ask us what we thought? Well, no. <laughs> And then as we got talking about it, they said, you know, if you would tweak this and this and this, we'd be all behind it. So, oh, okay, now we can do that. And it became one of the most successful programs of its kind in the country. Uh, but I also learned a great deal about, about the, those folks too. And they got to be good friends of mine. Now, there were conditions. There were still things on both ends of the spectrum that we disagreed on. And we were coming after each other hot on that. Usually they give me a heads up. Yeah, we got a news release that comes out and calls you, you know, the worst thing that ever happened. Okay, I'm with you. You got it. Um, but that happened less and less often because it's harder to really criticize somebody who's no longer faceless, somebody that you don't know. Um, and so I'm successful that way. I mean, as I was telling you, Carrie, we had some discussions later on, but you got to know each other well enough that you could complain about the other people that were part of your your side, the other environmental community. And they said, we are the most dysfunctional group in the world. I said, you haven't sat in the utility industry yet. So, um, so it happened. But anyway, you can find ways to be able to share it and find even when you don't agree on everything and even if you don't agree on most things, um, there's humanity in all of us. So you agree where you can. So that was a very short summation of what is usually an hour and a half workshop on the last skills. But if you just keep in mind, if you take nothing else away, to be an active listener and to, to turn off that inner debater and listen to what the other person says and try to understand their story. They may be open then to understanding yours. So what some expectations to abandon that you're gonna change somebody else's mind. It doesn't work with your spouse, it's not gonna work with anybody else. Um, or that they're going to play by the same rules. They, they're not all here today, so they haven't heard the same thing. So you're going to have to do the heavy lifting. 
And that's going to seem unfair and burdensome at times, but if we truly want to depolarize, somebody's got to take the first step. Somebody's got to do the heavy work. These skills don't work everywhere, every time. Um, they're better one-on-one -on -one than trying to do it with them, at least at first. Uh, there's some people like Bill Gore and others who are so skilled at it, they can do it in large groups and it works just fine. But it's group dynamics, family dynamics, are, and we've got an entirely different workshop on politics and family. Um, they must have seen my family. Uh, anyway, they, um, so, but it's harder in groups because you can get factions and all that kind of thing. And you know, there's just a little bit of playing to the crowd. And lastly, beware of the internet and social media. That's, it's, this is, that's difficult for us. And I don't know if there's any rules or any set of, of skills that are going to work well on that. One of the other things that I promised last family story uh, that I want to share with you is that um, as we think about the other side, again, it's kind of like me with the environmentalists and the nameless, faceless. Um, in each one of our families or our acquaintances, we can think of somebody who's on the other side. Now, in my case, my mom. My mom started out, um, her, her folks were Republicans. But she started out, I'd say, as pretty much a centrist Democrat. And over time, she moved more to the left, and more to the left, and more to the left, and more to the left. And she's 94, so I don't know how much more room there is. <laughs> um, and then there's my, my brother, Jim. He grew up in the, up in the uh, uh, northern part of Minnesota, very independent, very Republican, very conservative, and very vocal. And he's, with each passing years, moves more and more to the right. Now, he's 72, so he's still got a little bit of room. Um, but in watching those two in a political thing, it is not pretty. And it's been, it's been pretty ugly. And both of them, my mom, over time, has lost her filter, and my brother will never have one. So, so their conversations get pretty tight. But um, my sister had a, a, a life-threatening disease. And ultimately, she was in the hospital, and we had to make a decision. We're going to take this next step of very um, um, extensive, uh, life-saving measure. And so we don't know it's going to work. We want to do it. Yeah, she's probably going to lose her hands and her feet. Um, we don't know what the state of her mind is, though, either. My poor mom. She just didn't, she had no idea what to do. So my brother-in-law comes to me and sits by her. He says, Pat, with every breath I have, with every ounce of energy and the fiber of my life, I will give your daughter the best possible life I can. The, my sister and, and brother-in-law, very independent people, and he was going to have to take care of her. He was going to have to give up a lot of things that he normally did in order to do that, and he has done so. So do they not fight about politics? Oh, they fight like crazy about politics. But... The undying love for my sister unites them more and it's bigger than anything else that's, that's in their lives. So when I think about somebody on the far right, or somebody on the far left that's driving me crazy, I'm trying to get a picture of them. That I see their political side and I don't always like it, but it's a small sliver of who they are. They're much more than that. And these are good people who just see things differently. So I'm going to stop with some parking thoughts, and then we can do some question and answer. Um, again, each of us is so much more than the one vote we take every four years. And there's this is another Andy Stanley thing. There's no political issue that's worth destroying a family relationship or a friendship. And if this was the last conversation <laughs> you were ever going to have with that person, how do you want to remember? How do you want to have that one again? One of the things that... Uh, that I've used and, and heard others recommend is if you're at the end of that political conversation and you're not, you ended up with, well, you know, you and I are never going to see this the same way, but I got to tell you, you're still the best fisherman I've ever known. <laughs> or, you know, you're, you're just, I think you're just dead wrong on this. You're just not seeing it straight, but I have always greatly respected you as a mother, a boss, a brother, or a sister. So when you we have those conversations, End it the right way. For those of us in, in, uh, in, who are Christian and who are, are, are trying to live our faith as best we can, are we being the peacemakers, children of God, that we're asked to be? What does it say about our faith? And I often get the question, when, when are we going to be uh, stop being polarized? 
And we've gone through this as a country. Civil War, pretty polarizing time, much worse than it is now. And other times we've been in the same place during the Vietnam War, other, other issues as well. But ultimately, we stop being depolarized when we decide we want to be depolarized. And it starts with each of us. Yep. So we need to demand better of ourselves. We need, need to demand better of each other, too, particularly the people who are within our tribe, the people who think like we do. We need to make each other accountable. We need to be, demand better of our elected officials, and we need to demand better of the media. Those last two are a little harder to do. The first two are things we can do on our own. So with that, any questions or thoughts? We got a little bit of time here, I think, before the next survey starts. <laughs> So Thanksgiving is only a couple of weeks away. Uh, what if you're feeling like you're not ready to be in these conversations, no matter what the relationship? Uh, how do you, or is it okay to just say, you know, I can't do this right now and communicate to the other people? No, I think that's fair. Uh, and that's good, being in the right mood. If you're not, um, if it's, you know, if you can be funny about it, that's fine. If not, if it's just, just a, no, you know, this is a little too long. It's just not right for me. Let's talk about, find something. That, and that's a little bit of the prep work. It does come up. What's the other issue you prefer to talk about as opposed to that? But yeah, that's perfect. Here. And I know for a lot of people, this is really raw. And it might be a while before they're ready to talk about it. One of the things that it makes me think of is that for me specifically, and I'm sure for some others, Thanksgiving is a short period of time. And to delve into some of this robs you of the good things that your family means to you. And so that's why I originally said, no, I couldn't go there. And I agree, I'm not ready. I lost my husband at a lower year ago. So there's so much in me that I can't, I can't, can't do this. That's good self-awareness. Again, it's you know, not forcing anybody to do that. There's a time and a place. And for some people, they may never be comfortable with that. Um, my family now has the terminology. They, they say that I'm braver angeling than them. Um, so that's, uh, that's their key word for back off. Um, I said that was a kind of story. Sorry. Yeah, I'd say in my family, we have one person that can't talk about it, even with those who agree, like just can't be present in the conversation about politics now. So we all know that, we say that, and if um, it does come up, you just lose the group. Yeah. Hello. Right, so we, we do it as a, it's a, yeah, we're talking about a sensitive topic. He can't talk. It's not like looked out and bad or anything. We're overt about it. Like, yeah, he doesn't want to be a part of this. So, mm -hmm. just for those reasons. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I I wanted to put two things out here. Is one we just went through getting together in October with uh, all our siblings, and we range in a very a good variety. And one felt very disrespected, and he spent a lot of time talking to me. And it was a lot of things about why are what do you think? And so I finally came back to him and I opened it up by saying, I sincerely want to know why you feel the way you do. And that opened up the conversation. The other piece of introduction, we went through this in the 60s. Yeah. My sister is a Berkeley girl from the 60s. And me and her had a conversation about where we are, where we're going. And what they had figured out was they can't stop the war. You know, there's nothing they could do to have these and the peace people could do to stop the war. So what they decided to do was shift the dynamic and just say peace and love, and that's our centerpiece. Mm -hmm. And we can see from what the people who did 50, 60 years ago, the changes in our society that kept pushing us forward where we are today. 
So there is there is in the people that we have. That's it's great that you're able to have that conversation. I think particularly with our loved ones. Um, just back it off a little bit. You know, I truly want to hear what you've got to say. Um, and you know, with this last election, it might not be time, might never be time. You know, again, I don't want to pick a fight. I want to understand why what chose what led you to do what you chose to do. Uh, and then be respectful, listen to me. You don't have to agree with me. And they just be, oh, okay, thanks for sharing. Um, I think these slides were very helpful, and I noticed people taking pictures. Is there a way that you can provide um, printed um, slides? Absolutely. No, I'm kidding. Here he is. So if you want to distribute them around, feel free to. Yeah. I didn't make up the same price for somebody else. Yeah, <laughs> 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 And I'm not one meaning to get too personal before it comes to oh. uh, on a lighter note, uh, I feel we talked about Thanksgiving and politics growing up. I feel blessed because half of my a lot of my family goes from Ohio. They come up to my mother's in Michigan, and we she always hosted Thanksgiving. We never talked about politics because we we could get beyond the Michigan and Ohio State game. So we were, I feel we were blessed. I think we were blessed. Well, I have our time. Got to keep having the reps, too. Anybody else? Well, thank you for taking the time out today. I hope you were able to take something from this that you can find new forward with Thanksgiving going forward. And uh, and together, um, we'll be the peacemakers. Be the children of God, like the future is falling right now. Thank you.